a reading from the prophets. Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of God for the people of God. And thank you, Nancy and Tim and David, for that beautiful, beautiful song. And so we continue and then conclude our series, our summer series, on the Old Testament scriptures that we get to choose from the lectionary readings every Sunday. And today is the reading from Deuteronomy that you heard just a few moments ago. A little setting for this, just so you know. Deuteronomy, the Deutero means second, and it's the fifth verse, uh, fifth chapter of, fifth book, that's right, of Scripture in the Old Testament, at least in our Old Testament. And it's the second law. It takes place around the time that Josiah, the king of, of Israel, Judah, found uh, this other book, this, these books of the law, and it became a whole new resurgence and renewal of their life uh, of Israel. And it lasted for a while, but then the Babylonians came in and they carted off the first the leaders in Israel, in Jerusalem, and then another decade or so later, more people from Israel back to Babylon in that exile we know so well through Scripture. And so these words come from around that time, not sure exactly when, um, but around that early 6th century B.C. That's enough context right now. Let's move into the sermon and see where that takes us about what these words might mean. So let us all bow in prayer. Let us pray. Loving, holy one, gracious God, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day and for your presence with us this morning. And in your word this day, oh, open our eyes and our seeing, our ears and our hearing, our lives and our living. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was the proverbial bottom of the last inning. Two runners on. Two outs. I'm on the mound down in Florida. I am 46 years old. I am at fantasy camp for the Cleveland Indians. My earlier church, the previous one, gave me that as my 10-year anniversary for being there. Instead of a spiritual retreat, they sent me down to fantasy camp to play baseball perfect place for me to go after all those years of playing, but, you know, it was really, I've told you this before, but there was one moment during the entire week of working out and practicing and throwing and jumping and um, whatever, that I thought to myself, boy, this is great, but it was only one moment. 
It, it wasn't that dream week that I, I thought of. I had too many big memories of what I used to do and what I couldn't do now. But back to the game. There was an amount, and we had one batter up, uh, ready to hit, and we had a precarious situation in the game, and the manager calls timeout and comes to the mound like many managers would at that point. And I'm thinking, here's an old major league catcher from the 1960s for the Indians. He's going to come out and really give us that, that professional view of what we should be doing. You know, that, that wonderful like, like secret for how we play the game at this important juncture. And so all the infielders gather around me, and the, um, uh, the manager comes out, and he gets kind of low like this. And he says, come on, guys, gather around. And he says, okay, guys, let's go get him. <laughs> and then he walks back to the bench. And I was thinking, that wasn't much at all. I could have known that. We got to go get him. This pep talk didn't really work out the way I had hoped this pep talk would work. But in the same way, Moses, in our story, is on the plains of Moab. He's talking to all the Israelites who have just wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, and they are on the precipice of the promised land. They can see it out there. And we know Moses dies on the mountain of Moab before he ever gets to the promised land. But he gives this speech, this sermon, this indeed pep talk to the Israelites and what life can be and how we should live that life as we move into this promised land, into the future. And he gives this beautiful sermon that we read just the last part of for our scripture lesson today. Did you hear two words that are always lifted up from this scripture? The two words that could be a bumper sticker? The two words that maybe we can remember enough as we leave this place to try to figure out in our own life, what does this mean? The two words that Moses said, choose life. That's what got people's attention, I'm sure. Choose life. Now, remember what I said about Babylon and how they took over Jerusalem and how they then destroyed the temple and they carted people off to another land, the exile, a foreign land. And this is the words that people are hearing and experiencing. They are the ones hearing this for the first time, experiencing all of that loss, all of that terror, all of the violence of their day, seeing this happen and wondering if they're going to be taken away from their homeland. And so when Moses, who spoke 700 years earlier, or 600 years earlier, he says, choose life, what in the world does that mean? And in our own day, when we're dealing with a swirl of issues that are just bombarding our culture, just make a list, you probably have, of all the things that pressure our lives and how we're not living fully and we're not sure where the future will take us, and Moses comes up with this, choose life, and what might it mean? We had a rousing discussion at the first service upstairs in the rooftop garden about what choose life means to them. They had all sorts of little pep talks as well uh, that they've heard. You know, don't worry about it. Everything's going to work out okay. I mean, it's one of them. You hear that a lot? I mean, that, that's not a pep talk, but still, we hear that a lot. You know, just do your best. You know, buckle down and do your best. All these things were coming out on how we can deal with today. But the best one of all was Moses, who spoke up and said, no, it's choose life. I've said this many times in our hymnal, I mean, glory to God. You know, I keep going back to the, the, the definition from Irenaeus from the second century before the Roman Empire took over the church. And Irenaeus said, the glory, glory to God is, remember this? The glory to God is a human being fully alive. Choose life. 
how might we be fully alive in our own living? Well, if you look at our liturgy this morning, you can take that home with you. You can take all those thoughts about what being fully alive or choosing life might look like. It might look like choosing to serve other people beyond yourselves, to do something beyond your aura around your life, to think of somebody else and do something for them. A blessing may be a way of choosing life. We will say a blessing pretty soon, and it's all about choosing life over all that we might be experiencing. Oh, at the first service, I know that people just look forward to our children saying that blessing to us. That may be the highlight of the service, when a little four-year-old may be saying, in body, mind, and spirit, may you be well this day, and may you be strong for the work of healing in the world. And to hear a voice this high say that makes a deep difference. Maybe that's what choosing life is. Choosing life may be simply coming here today and hoping to hear something that might make your heart sing. That you're choosing to come here. No one's making you come to worship. No one is at all. You're a volunteer participant in worship. And how wonderful it is to hear the life around us, to hear the songs around us, hear the beautiful music before us, and to hear the prayers being prayed and the scripture being read and then communion being celebrated and maybe somewhere along there your heart will sing. Did I tell you about when my heart sang? I, I, I've probably shared the four times my heart has sung. Most of it had to do with church. Can you believe that? I thought baseball would probably do that for me, but it didn't. Here's the one I, I remember the most right now for this day, and, and time along if I've told this story so many times, but it still stays with me. From a doctor of ministry class on preaching, that ring a bell? 1991, Crystal Lake, Illinois, out of McCormick Seminary, Professor Frank Thomas taught about four or five of my colleagues in that class, that program, on how to do preaching and how maybe from an African-American style, I never quite picked that up yet, but I'm still working on it. And how you can find joy in all of that. I wrote a sermon that week, and I couldn't wait to give it when I got back to Lake Forest, Illinois. But it was getting in the car after we were done, and it was January, and there was freshly fallen snow, and there was kind of glistening on the ground, glistening in the trees as, as the snow kind of laid on those leaves, or the branches at least. And I went home for an hour drive, and I thought my world was opened up to me. I thought I was kind of in one of those thin places between heaven and earth. I thought that maybe from now on, my life would be like this all the time. I didn't choose that. It was chosen for me. But I have a taste of what that felt like, to really be fully alive. Unfortunately, as it always happens, I got home and all of a sudden I was back home and I was in Lake Forest and I did my job and I got up the next morning and it was gone. But you see, to get some sense of what we can look to, like a promised land, what that might be in our own life, what a promised land could be in this culture. What if we were to treat each other right? What if we were to remember Micah? 6, 8, and say, yes, I want to work on justice, and I want to work on walking humbly with God and showing kindness to other people. Maybe that's what choosing life is. Maybe choosing life is to really be concerned about people on the border. Maybe choosing life is really concerned about people who are terrified of gun violence or any kind of violence. Maybe choosing life is really remembering sunflowers and knowing that Ukraine is still dealing with a war. Maybe choosing life is not to let the life we are feeling now take us down as much as to be able to lift us up and to say that in the worst of times is the time that we are supposed to choose life and not despair. Light over darkness. Hope over despair. 
love over hatred. This is the time. This church does this. The Peace and Global Witness Offering will do that more. The ways that the Mission Committee and Mission and Social Justice Committee works out in the world. The way that you all serve each other and the others uh, that we don't even know their names. Those are the people that we can choose life for. And so I offer that today as simply two words to take back with you. Whatever it might mean for you in a day like this, a day of exile, a day of being in a foreign land, a day that is so pressure-filled that we're not sure how we can breathe, but choose life instead. Now, I know you're probably wondering what happened to that baseball game. I mean, I can't end, because if I end it without using the, the baseball illustration, people ask me outside shaking hands about what happened in, in the rest of the game. Here's what happened. My manager goes back to the bench. I go back to the mound. Remember, two outs, two, men out, two runners on, and we're up by one. Any base hit's going to probably lose the game for us. And as the manager goes back, he moves our first baseman over into the infield a few feet. I'm not sure why, but remember with that little tidbit. Three and two count, bottom of the last inning, you know the story. The person hits the ball right where that first baseman was. But he's over here now, and so the ball goes right down the right field line, and I'm almost to that age now, so I can't disparage anyone who's 65, but that was our right fielder. And he was having a little trouble running that day. And so the ball got by him, game's over. We didn't really get them. <laughs> but maybe that's not the point. Despite all the failures, despite losing games in the last inning, despite things not going right all the time, and all the ways that our culture tells us to choose despair, That's exactly when we remember Moses and decide it's finally time that I'm going to choose life. Thanks be to God for all of you for that life. Amen.